I get thirsty again. So if you have your Bibles, John 4. We're going to look at John 4, 4, 4 through 14. My goodness, I'm going to get tongue-tied with all the fours. I apologize. But before we go into that, Jesus mentions living water in two separate occasions in the Bible. One in this one right here in John 4 and the other in John chapter 7. And we're going to look at them both. And just to give you a little bit of context right here, uh, as we read this, the, the scripture in John 4, 4 through 14, um, there's a lot going on here. Jesus was on his way back to Galilee. He had to make a trip, okay? So here we go. Let's read. Um, starting in verse 4. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Shekar, near the village that Jacob gave his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tried, or I'm sorry, Jesus tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. Said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoy? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for being thirsty. Father, not physically thirsty, but spiritually thirsty, Lord God, ready to receive you, Father, ready to receive that living water. So, Father, today, I pray that we lay it all down, Lord God, and we just give our attention to you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. So, a few things of note that I kind of want to uh, talk about that we need to kind of look at real quick in these first few verses of Scripture. Um, first thing we need to look at is uh, Jesus was a Jew, okay? Um, and Jews and Samaritans, they had a very long-standing animosity towards each other. They did not like each other whatsoever, uh, mainly for the fact that the Jews thought they were better than the Samaritans because the Samaritans were considered by the Jews a mixed race. So they didn't like them. They kind of looked down on them. They thought they were better than them. Another, another thing we need to look at right here is there was other routes that Jesus and his disciples could have taken to get back to Galilee. But this was the shortest, most direct route. And um, as a matter of fact, most Jews would actually avoid going through Samaria just because they hated the Samaritans so much. They didn't even want to, to be near them. They didn't want to be around them. Kind of reminds me of segregation in this country way back in the day, if you want to kind of look at it a little bit. But that's what they would do. They would go out of their way just to avoid these people. Hmm. Something else of note that we can kind of look at right here is this woman that, that we're talking about right here in John chapter 4. If you notice, she went to the well at noontime. Now, I don't know about you, but normally the hottest part of the day is around noontime. Because normally when women went to draw water from the well, they went twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. So she probably went to the well at noon to get water so she could avoid other people. Man, she wasn't counting on who she was about to meet, was she? And the last thing of note to look here, well, one of the last things, um, this woman that we're talking about, 
she was known to be living in sin. I mean, it, it was no secret. Okay? And this well was a very public place because a lot of people came to draw water from this well. Uh, and that being said, pretty much no respectable Jewish man, if they happened to find themselves at this well in Samaria, would even talk to a woman like this under such circumstances. So pretty much everything that we could think of was against this woman right here. Sounds like a pretty divine intervention, wouldn't you say? And as we look back at it, and we pointed those few things out, but when we go back and look at it, the question that she asked Jesus uh, in verse 9, it says the woman was surprised for, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? But Jesus had bigger things on his mind because he totally ignored that question. He wasn't really worried about the physical right then. And we'll kind of learn a little later on when his disciples get back and they try to offer him some food that they went to buy. Jesus said, hang on a minute. I got more important things to go do right now. So she was sitting here just fixated on the physical. And Jesus is like, hang on. We're going to look at the spiritual. As you see, he totally ignored the question. And instead he responds, without answering a question, he responds with this. If only you knew the gift that God has for you. And I want to point this out right here, church, because this is awesome. He made it personal. He did not say, if only you knew the gift that God had for your people, uh, for this or for that. He made it personal sitting there with this lady. And he looked at her and he said, if you only knew the gift that God has for you. Now that's personal.
John 7, 39 is kind of the key to understanding what this living water actually means and represents. Because we understand that the requirements for salvation was faith in Jesus. And we cover that in verses 37 and 38. Because we look at the words of anyone and whoever. Because he stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, basically saying, anyone out there, if you thirst, let them come to me and drink. And then he says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture out of as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The result of salvation is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of what it means, likened onto rivers of living water. Jesus also, he promised his disciples um, the promise of the Spirit in John 16, 7 through 15. He tells them, hey, you're going to get this. Because the Spirit, and we talked about this one Wednesday night a while back. The Spirit is always involved in salvation. And that comes from John 3, 5 through 8. But we also need to understand that at this point in time, when Jesus was talking about this, that the permanent indwelling of the Spirit would have to wait until a later time. Jesus had to go back and ascend back into heaven. So as we look at this living water, okay, the picture of the Spirit as living water leads us to a few things. To these three conclusions. The Spirit gives life. That's the first one. The Spirit gives life. Just as water refreshes and revitalizes a person who sat on their lawnmower and cut grass all day, a person who's gone out and played basketball or baseball, or the person who goes out and works in flower beds, or whatever it is you may do, just as water revitalizes and refreshes you, the Spirit does the same thing to a believer. It refreshes them. It, in, it just revitalizes them. It invigorates them. It gives them almost like a new life. And the cool thing about that is, is when the Spirit does that, and the Spirit refreshes and revitalizes the believer and enables God to start producing fruit in their lives. Because doesn't the Bible say something about, you know, know a person about the fruit that they bear? So if you don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be producing fruit. And how are people going to know that we belong to God if we're not producing fruit? The second thing, the Spirit I mean, after all, Jesus said, I will give you living water. He didn't say, I'm going to give you dead water, stagnant water, stale water, moldy water. He said, no, I will give you living water. The Spirit is active. It's kind of opposed to like the standing or stagnant water. It flows. Living water flows. A spring of water welling up. Eternal life, John 4, 14. He is a flowing river of water. Number three. Now the first two, pretty easy to get, but number three, here's where, here's where we kind of come in a little bit right here. Um, believers are channels for the Spirit's work. Ooh. We got stuff to do. I know I've talked about that before, but believers are channels the Spirit's work. At the well in Samaria, Jesus said the water would be in them and it would well up and it would overflow. So that just doesn't tell me that a believer is supposed to sit down and do absolutely nothing because if that were the case, Jesus would not say it would well up and overflow within a believer. It would be stagnant. It would be dead. So we are to be active. We are to channel the Spirit's work. Look at it this way. The Spirit gives gifts. And the believer shall receive spiritual blessings or communications of divine grace. In such great abundance that not only will the believer be 
refreshed and comforted himself or herself, but shall be instrumental in comforting and refreshing others. That's why we overflow. That's why the Spirit overflows. Because we are a channel of the Spirit's work. We can't sit still. We're not to be an idol only for an hour on a Sunday morning pew. We have to be active seven days a week. We need to be channeling the Spirit's work each and every day, no matter where we go. And I understand that's hard to do sometimes. Because if you're like me, you probably find yourself in some situations that you're like, man, God, why did you let me do this? Why did you put me here? And the response I typically get is, so I can shine. Not that Stephen can shine, but that God can shine. So that people can see my works through you because you need to channel the Spirit's work. And this is kind of exactly the example that we see in John 4 with the Samaritan world, the Samaritan woman at the well. Because remember, so we didn't read it, but we talked about it because at the end, she leaves her water jar. Now remember, she went to the well for one specific purpose in her mind, and now Jesus knew differently, but when she went to the well, she went to gather water. She had nothing else on her mind. She was not ready for an encounter like she had with Jesus, which is much the same for us today. Because when we go about our business doing the things that we want to do, typically we're not in the mindset of having an encounter with God. And she wasn't either, but she did. And we need to be aware of these kind of things when they happen to us, that we need to always be seeking God. So when she went there with the one intention of drawing water from this well, and then she had an encounter with Jesus, she all of a sudden realized what was important, and it wasn't that physical water. Because if you go back and you read the scriptures, it says that she left. She went to the town, and guess what? She started working right away because she told everybody about Jesus. That's pretty cool. In closing, in Isaiah 44, verse 3, God, he told his people, Israel, he told Israel, the Israelites, don't fear, and he gave them a promise. He said, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. And that's a promise. Even before Jesus came and made his two statements about living water, we see it in the Old Testament. Short sermon today. <coughs> but in closing, I have a question. Are you thirsty? Are you spiritually thirsty this morning? Because I know the one who can put that there. And I can tell you how to do it. Maybe you're here today and you've got that, that, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You've received that living water. But every now and again, every now and again, the enemy comes in and he wants to try to build a dam and stop the flow of that living water. Maybe we need to knock that dam down this morning. And we need to let that water start flowing again. That's what the enemy's good at. He's good at messing up God's children. But maybe you're here this morning and you've got the living water, but things just aren't going the way that you think they should go. Or maybe they're, you know that they're not going the way that they need to be going. And if that's the case, I can help you with that too because I can point you to the one who destroys the enemy. We're going to have a time of invitation like we typically do. So before we do, we're going to go to God in prayer. And I want to encourage everyone. If there's something going on, or if you don't know Jesus this morning, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. If you've got something going on, bring it to God today. Don't wait. Do not wait. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how small it is. 
It doesn't matter because if you're like me, sometimes you think your problems are not as important as other people's problems. But let me tell you, eventually your problems will get too big that you can't handle. Which, even the smallest ones are typically too big that I can't handle. I've got to give them to him. Whatever the situation may be, whatever the need is this morning, bring it to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for each and every blessing. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for your spirit that you pour out on us. Lord God, we thank you that, you that you have the Holy Spirit come in and live in us. Father, we thank you that the Holy Spirit starts to transform us and making us new creations. Father God, today I pray, Lord, that if there is one person that's thirsty this morning, Lord, I pray that you, that you would just work on that heart this morning. Lord God, because... We're going to try with everything that we can to fill that thirst with all the physical things we can. But Lord, it doesn't matter how much water, physical water we drink, we will be thirsty again. But Lord, by saying that you give us living water, if we believe in you, which is the Holy Spirit, Lord, you're saying again that you are essential for life. Father, we love you.